тогда. Да, так это да. работает, а это вот сюда надо. <coughs> сюда надо. Да. Ну, да, да. да теперь. Вот что. Вот что. Шоколадной здесь не видно пока. Сейчас он откроется. <coughs> О, все есть. Да, ну и все. Замечательно. Все. Спасибо тебе. Так, а этот. А где пауэрт у вас? Куда доставать ты мне? А, наверное, вот сюда вот сюда, да? Ну да, для нет. Вероятно, не здесь, только не очень хорошо. У меня, может, и длинные. Все мелочи продумать, тогда будет легче. Да, это лучше не заранее делать. Конечно, действительно. Все, будет деть, так сказать. И я спокойнее буду. Тебе, Люк, спасибо. Так, это лучше нет. Ну вот, сюда можно. Хватит, хватит. Хватит, да? Хватит, да?
трогать. Что-то я не, не, не туда вышел. Вот. Ну, можно подняться на камне там. Ну, потом. Ну, это, это да. Это потом. Так, сейчас у меня доклад.
if you put it to the power minus one fourth, should be directly proportional to the color correction. Okay, through the, some normalization which is related to this angular size of the surface of the, the star of the sky. So in principle, this is the most important equation that we need for the purpose of the rest of the talk. So here on the left hand side, something you can measure, and on the right hand side, A is also, of course, you can measure from the data, it's the normalization factor, and the color correction factor as a function of the flux, let's say, or luminosity in Eddington units, you can get from the models from theory. Okay, so in principle, the right-hand side, color correction is a theoretical thing, on the left-hand side is an observed thing, and the two, uh, two quantities here are that you would like to get from the data is this A and Ed Eddington flux. So once you have a normalization A, which are related to the solid angle that neutrons are occupied in the sky and the Eddington flux, with these two numbers, actually you can play a game, and you can get, okay, I will play with later, I'll show you later. Uh, you can get uh, the constraints of the mass and radius of the neutron star. Okay, so, but in order to get this, first you have to have a correct model that you get the color correction factor. And uh, actually, the, this story started somewhere in the middle of 80s with the work of uh, London in 84 and 86, where they computed actually some set of atmosphere models for different chemical composition. But uh, uh, unfortunately, this set was not large enough to make you now these like direct calculations with cooperation with the data. There were some uh, later models where some also calculations were done. But recently we have computed with Valery Solimano uh, a large and, uh, set of atmosphere models where you, we vary uh, gravity, uh, Eddington, the luminosity in units of Eddington, and for different chemical compositions. So this is just a subset of those, uh, we have many hundred models. And the end result of that calculation, which is important for the purpose of this talk, is the color correction factor as a function of the luminosity in units of Eddington. Okay, so independently basically of the chemical composition that has this kind of shape, close to the Eddington luminosity, it has the, this factor is about 1.8 or so, and there is a minimum somewhere at half of the Eddington with the typical number 1.4 or 1.5. Okay, so this is a theoretical curve, and we can compare this curve to the data, trying to get some numbers out. Okay, but before we start looking at the real data, we would like to actually check whether the data actually consistent with our theoretical models. And uh, if I show you again this color correction factor, it varies from about 1.8 to 1.4 or 1.5, but normalization should scale like color correction factor to power minus 4. So in, in this, if, therefore, if color correction factor varies by a factor of like 20%, you would expect that normalization of the black body emission that you, you get should vary by a factor of two at least. Okay, so of course the neutron star surface doesn't change at all during the birth, right? The photosphere, is in the, at least in the, in the end of the birth, is always on the surface of the neutron star. But the number that you get from the fit is directly related to this color correction factor. Okay, so k is goes like f to minus one fourth. This number that the, the, the source occupies on the sky is constant but the color correction change. Therefore, you should expect changes in the normalization of the black body. So how actually the black body normalization changes is shown in this picture. There are many things that are shown. By black, you have the flux, polymetric flux, how it's changing. Red is the temperature variations between 1 and 3 keV here. And by blue band here is the shown the change of the normalization, of the black body normalization. And there is a point which people call a touchdown. This is the point when the after the photosphere, of the, after strong explosion has expanded, it sort of goes back and touches the neutron star surface. So at this moment, which we call time down, the temperature is the maximum, flux is uh, not the maximum, but close to that, and the normalization is the minimum. But after that, normalization is slowly rising. Okay, so now, if you, you, if you think that, okay, this is the maximum luminosity which is close to the Eddington, here somewhere, let's take the point in this light curve where the Eddington, uh, where the luminosity dropped by a factor of two. At this point, you should reach the minimum in the color correction. Okay, so you would expect that from that point to that point, the color, the normalization of the black body should change by a factor of two at least. What we can do, we can take a look at this data here. The normalization actually plotted here on the right hand side, and you see this is the logarithmic space. So you see that it was somewhere like 200 here, and then the maximum is maybe 600, so it does vary, but this is by factor 2, maybe more. 
Okay, let's look at the collection of sources of verse from the same source. This is the source, now known extra binary. And what we plotted, this is we plotted the ratio of those blackboard normalization at two moments of this slide curve from at the touchdown and a few, few seconds later when the flags drop by a factor of two. And on the x-axis we plot persistent flux here. This is the flux before the burst of the by uh, uh, basically accretion rate. Or here we'll plot also color, uh, some index which tells you where the source was in the color color diagram as shown here. Or we can plot the time it takes uh, for the burst to reach this touchdown. So how long is super on expansion phase? And amazingly, there are two groups of bursts. There is one group of bursts. Let's look at this uh, persistent flux here as an exercise. There is one burst at low persistent flux which has color, this ratio of larger than two seems consistent with the models, and then there is another group of bursts that have high persistent fluxes that has this ratio much smaller, smaller than one, very close to unity, which is completely inconsistent with our models. So the first conclusion that we have to draw from here, that there are two classes of bursts, one class, and the lower persistent flux, actually is close to what we expect from theoretical models, and another, high persistent flux, is completely inconsistent with our theoretical models. So something that we don't understand. Okay, so this is the just one side. Uh, this is the spectrum of the persistent emission before the burst. At low persistent flux, is basically power law looking like spectra. This is new, new, and this is that the uh, high persistent flux in the solid state, which we call. This is like curvy spectrum, which reminds me of something thermal emission, black body looking emission. So clearly, uh, from here we should uh, immediately realize that. Those two types of bursts, they're related to the accretion state. Those that happen in this low flux, hard state, they sort of are consistent with the theory, and those which have happened at high accretion rate at the soft state, they are not consistent with the theory. Of course, if one goes think a little bit about accretion geometry in those two states, one normally assumes that, okay, in the hard state we have some kind of fluffy flow, and amazingly, the neutron star doesn't care about this fluffy flow that falls on the surface of the neutron star. But in the soft state, at high accretion rate, you have this boundary spring layer that actually distorts the atmosphere of the neutron star, but it also affects the atmosphere by triggering and basically steering it, because the mass falls on the neutron star and affects it. So probably that's why there are, and actually it blocks the half of the neutron star also, the accretion is. So therefore, obviously, you should expect that there are you do expect actually that those two, the person having two states should be different. Okay, on this diagram, k to power minus 4, we should go like color correction, and here's the flux. There's a su subset of bursts, and with the models plotted above them, it's sort of consistent with the data, and here you can see that uh, the soft state bursts are completely inconsistent with the, uh, sorry, with the models. Okay, of course, now we, what we can do, we can we just get those parameters that I told A and F Eddington, and from those two numbers, you can get constraints on the mass and radius of the neutron star, if you know the distance. That's important to think. So if you know the size of the neutron star on the sky, you get one constraint. If you know the electron flux, you, know, you get another constraint. Okay, and there, they should cross somewhere. Unfortunately, when the distance, the distance is unknown, there, there is a, a certain here, and all the solutions should lie along this blue uh, solid line, which is called the electron diversion. This is basically when the luminosity is added on the surface of the neutron star, and if you have the black body emission, this is the temperature you should see. The effective temperature you should see. But so that all the solutions will be lying along this blue line. So we feed the data, and we get the solutions then. So this is mass of the neutron star, this is radius. The solution, as I said, they're, they're spread over this line. There is also a perpendicular spread because we don't know the chemical composition and we actually can sorry to say well, it's a pure hydrogen on the surface of the neutron star or maybe it's a solar composition and there are, therefore there is a, a spread here because actually the edit on the flux depends on the chemical composition of the surface. Uh, so we should concentrate on these blue contours. So what do they tell us those blue contours? Actually that's the, if you think that what is the minimum possible mass of the neutron star? Uh, typically, we know that in pulsars, it's, uh, they always what we measure about one solar mass. So we, let's cut our distribution here. We don't know what's the maximum mass of the neutron star somewhere, maybe two and a half. So maybe we should cut it here. 
So the physical solutions are here between maybe one and one and a half. The minimum radius you get is about 30 kilometers. Of course, these solutions they do cross with some theoretical uh, calculations for from uh, theoretical models of uh, nuclear matter and uh, high densities, but it's clear that these data favor rather stiff equation of state that with large neutron stars. Okay? So, of course, now if I show you the soft state data, with, uh, this is the evolution of the real data for different colors at different bursts, and this is our model. Clearly, you cannot fit those data. But if you just naively assume that from this normalization and you can learn something about the neutron star, yeah. you can try to play the game similar to what I just said, but you can't fit the real data. You just say that the normalization that I measure is here. Assume some color correction somewhere here, where is the cross maybe is the Eddington limit, so you can get constraints which actually are here with the blue, the very low neutron star radiant masses, and uh, uh, not like, uh, but I mean, as I said, these data are not consistent with the theory, so actually we can use it. we cannot use the theory to construct to get constraints. There were some papers by a group from Arizona that actually claimed that constraints are much better and that the data are there. But for, for in order to get these small uh, error bars, you need to cut the distance distribution very sharply. You have to make a very sharp cut on the distance distribution. And uh, therefore, the, you reduce basically error bars to nothing. But uh, as I said, these bursts are not consistent with the theory that this data uh, that, uh, the, the feet are based on. So I come to my conclusions. Basically, the thing that I would like you to take home is that there are two types of bursts. Not all the bursts are the same, but clearly we see bursts happen in the hard state and the soft state. They are different. Okay. Even where I was talking about the very powerful uh, superregional bursts, but even they are different. So those that happen in the hard state at low friction rate, they are rather well explained by the theory that we have for the passive neutron star atmosphere. But those which have happened in the soft state when the accretion rate is high, they're not consistent with the theory. There is something that we don't understand. This accretion rate, a high accretion rate, matter falling on the neutron star surface really affects the spectrum that you see. So the evolution is probably not related to the cooling of the, of, uh, of the neutron star after the burst, but actually because the, you have additional energy dissipation in the surface layer, that the evolution is basically related to this energy dissipation. Uh, the current data that uh, we use from the birth that happened in the hot state are consistent with around large neutron star radius about 13 kilometers, and this favors hot equation of state. I should remind you that there are two neutron stars and pulsars with white dwarf companions that uh, we have measured neutron star masses about two solar mass, okay, and these also require a rather hot, uh, steep equation of state. So therefore, uh, our results are consistent with, with that. Uh, what I didn't mention, of course, that there is actually, we are continuing to develop our atmosphere models because everything what I said, the atmosphere models, it was related uh, to the neutron star which are not rotating. And some of the neutron stars that we are talking about show an extra burst, actually they rotate between 300 and 600 times a second. So actually, when they rotate so rapidly, the neutron star is not spherical anymore. The distribution, they are not, uh, so the radiation that they, they produce is not uh, spherically symmetric because we have Doppler effect, and we have gravity which is changing over the latitude of the neutron star. So there are many complicated effects that we are now working on, trying to understand if we include those rotations in the models, how this affects our uh, constraints of the mass and radius. So there is still something to do, and we are working on that. Thank you very much. Your stay, uh, soft state, but I know there is expansion stage in the Earth. Yeah, yeah, there is a super Eddington phase. Super Eddington, uh, you call this soft state? No, 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 a soft state, this is, this is the state of the source before the burst. Uh -huh. So, the, the, the burst starts here, there is something here, there is a mission before the burst. Before the burst, you have a creature. Ah, you are and we are talking about the soft about state the of the accretion state. Yeah. But not expansion and contraction. No. Okay. Yeah, so I, I, I'm not talking about this expansion phase. Here yeah. there is no, uh, yeah. like, you have both here expansion. This, in expansion yeah, the both is, this is very complicated. Yeah. 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 And I wrote a few papers. I'm sure. Other questions?
I have a short question. I mean, uh, should you really be surprised that when you have this uh, low state when the disk approaches the surface of the star and you soft develop state. well, yes, yeah, soft, 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 soft state in which you uh, should expect the development of the boundary layer, the yes. spreading layer, and so on, that the simple theory fails. Yeah. I'm not surprised at all. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, <laughs> I mean, I'm not surprised. I mean, this is just a fact that we see that our simple theory does fail. And I'm not surprised at all. So, of course, uh, I mean, there are many reasons for why it fails, just because, as you already showed this picture also, that uh, there is a spreading layer that the, the gas spreads over the neutron side surface. And it spreads in the atmosphere, it stirs the atmosphere, so of course it affects. And then, it, actually, you block half of the neutron star, so how you can be sure that you see the whole neutron star, even during the burst? Certainly not in the last phases of the burst. So, I'm okay. not surprised. Um, more questions? If not, let's thank our speaker again. Uh, next talk will be given by uh, Michael Gibbs, who will talk about the emission of neutron stars as a tool to measure matter properties at uh, supernuclear densities. Okay, so probably I will support. Uh, tradition by Yuri to change the title of the talk. So I will uh, speak uh, more specifically on the boundary spreading layer as a perspective method to measure mass radius relation of different stars. Uh, I will not uh, talk much about the uh, task to measure the radio of neutral stars because it's it's clear that uh, the neutron star is one of the densest or maybe the dens densest objects in the universe and we do not understand how they behave in the, in the centers and almost the only uh, way to, to understand this is to measure, uh, to measure sizes of neutron stars and uh, maybe they might be even some uh, exotic uh, matter, uh, matter uh, state like a quark matter which uh, in some works was claimed to be uh, the ground state of baryonic matter. So, and uh, there are essentially two ways to measure neutron star sizes. It's uh, from something like the Stephen Boltzmann law, and uh, Yuri was describing this in the previous talk. And uh, the second way, uh, which we might think about, it's uh, the energy spectrum of, of the surface. Uh, so, uh, so therefore, we can somehow infer the surface gravity of a neutron star. And uh, why why we can do this? And uh, we should remember about uh, uh, this uh, spreading layer theory, which uh, appears to be uh, describing uh, reality. And uh, in, in, two, in two words, I will uh, uh, describe how, how it looks like. So, uh, spreading layer essentially is the layer of matter which is settles over the neutron star surface. So, here is a, is a neutron star, here comes a disk. And uh, the matter, instead of uh, dumping immediately to the, to the surface of the neutron star, it starts to spread over the latitude and uh, gradually moving, it emits. And uh, because the radiation pressure dominates in this case, essentially uh, there are only two forces which, is, which are uh, affecting the matter in this layer. It's uh, radiation pressure and the gravity. And if radiation pressure dominates, it means that uh, these two forces should be uh, should be almost equal in order to be in a stable situation. So therefore, uh, we can assume that they should be something like uh, Eddington limited flux from a square centimeter of the of the sur of uh, emitting surface. And uh, here are some plots from from work of Inagawa from '99. And uh, what we expect in this case is that uh, the temperature of the radiation should not seriously depend on n dot. And we can try to understand is it true or not. Uh, let's then uh, consider observations and uh, we should uh, remember how <coughs> neutron star emission looks like. Uh, typically, it, you can uh, separate it into two broad classes. It's a so-called uh, soft high state and a hard low state. In uh, these two states uh, dif uh, are different from the point of view of internal, of uh, innermost parts uh, of the emission flow. In one case, where emission rate is low, then the innermost part is optically thin. And in the high uh, soft state, uh, inner part is optically thick, and this uh, spreading layer can be formed. So we should consider only this high soft state in order to look for a spreading layer. Uh, this is how, how it looks in reality. This uh, energy spectrum, broadband energy spectrum in X-ray from uh, 
uh, some neutrons are in the hard state and in the soft state, and we see the clearly difference. So this optical thing emission we will not consider this anymore, and we will look at uh, more like these sources. Uh, but here, what is important, so we expect that here we should have two components. One component should be from the optical thick disk, and another component is from optical thick boundary layer. And how, how we can separate them, and that is a big problem, because here you can see two examples of uh, spectra uh, which contains two components, and how you can separate them, that's not clear, because technically you do not even see here uh, error bars, because they are so tiny. And uh, there are definitely two components here. So how we can do this? Uh, pro uh, complexity of the separation led to uh, so-called uh, color-color diagram language because uh, it is it's not clear how, how you can really uh, explain uh, the separation. So therefore, from uh, uh, papers on, from 80s, uh, it is uh, considered to be uh, more informative to talk about color behavior or behavior on uh, how uh, sources move on the color, color diagram or power spectra and so on. So not really in the, from the physical point of view. And uh, another demonstration of the same problem uh, you can see here. So let's take again uh, some source and uh, let's uh, assume that uh, one component is a black body with this temperature. And uh, then we uh, assume that another component is a Christian disk component and uh, try to fit them. And we obtain something like a black points here. So with the accuracy like a couple of percents, we obtain a very nice fit. But then let's assume that we have uh, not a single temperature black body, but a uh, two temperature black body. Uh, one component is a two temperature black body and another component is again a Christian disk. So therefore, we will obtain this de de decomposition. So one is black decomposition, another is blue decomposition. Accuracy of, uh, of the model is this, of the same order, order, of several percent, a few percent. But uh, decomposition is completely different. So in one case, inner uh, disk temperature is almost 2 keV, another inner disk temperature is 0.7 keV. It's a dramatic difference. In the, in the flux, difference is maybe order of magnitude. So spectral decomposition in this uh, way is very ambiguous. Uh, recently there was pro proposed uh, to use something like a desirability criteria, so let's take this decomposition that we would like to have. So like uh, some components should have luminosity proportional to temperature to power of 4. But uh, I don't consider this approach as, as a robust one. So therefore we proposed uh, to use another uh, dimension in the data and we, we know this dimension. A dimension is time. So it's like here, if we do not have a color information, then we will not see information that, that is decoded in, in the picture. So let's just uh, look at the variability information and we know that the spectrum varies at different frequencies and uh, if one component varies at some high frequency and another component doesn't vary, so we can use this uh, information and just to separate stable component and variable component. Uh, <coughs> Spectra uh, variability of uh, neutron stars uh, can be characterized by different phenomena like broadband noise, some QPO frequencies, this one at, uh, at 10 hertz, 100 hertz, several hundred hertz. Uh, schematically, it can be represented like here. And uh, what we what we have shown several some time ago that uh, all variability at all frequencies above approximately 1 hertz happens only in one spectral component. So this is uh, you see here uh, crosses uh, from uh, variability at different frequencies like 1 Hz, 10 Hz, 45 Hz, uh, 1000 Hz or several hundred Hz. And the same model is applied for all data. So you see that the spectral variations in all frequencies is, has the same spectrum. And uh, uh, in our work we showed that uh, it can be ascribed, this component can be ascribed to uh, boundary layers. So how we can then separate, uh, how we can decompose the spectrum into two components. So one you see here, another you see here, here is already in more physical units uh, from the point of view of luminosity. So this uh, luminosity is approximately 10 times higher than this one. Uh, temperature of the disk is uh, really different by the factor that we expect from the point of view of uh, mass accretion rate. And the boundary layer spectrum it stays almost the same. That's exactly what we have anticipated in the case of that was predicted predicted in the model of uh, of uh, spring layer. 
Uh, what is interesting, recently we can even do this in uh, hard X-rays, so uh, our claim is that uh, at, hard, uh, at hard X-rays we should not see difference in strong difference in the temperature of the component. And we really do see that this hard spectral component high, at energies higher than 20 keV, which should be extremely sensitive to temperature, uh, is, is quite constant. So I will not uh, spend too much time on this plot. So this is uh, another representation uh, of, uh, of uh, contribution of different components, but in a bit broad uh, perspective. So here you see the accretion disk uh, shifts towards higher uh, energies and the uh, boundary layer stays almost the same. So why, we, uh, we, uh, why it is important for us? Because in this case we can say that we can measure effective temperature. That's exactly what described uh, you in the previous talk. So effective temperature of adding to limit of flux. And uh, this color temperature can be used then to infer some information about masses and radius on unit stars. So in our paper we made some very uh, stupid assumptions, some very dumb assumptions. First assumptions about uh, color corrections and then we can already obtain some constraints. Uh, in a more sophisticated approach uh, done by Suleiman and Putin in, uh, in 2006, uh, they explicitly calculated the radiation transfer and obtained more accurate uh, number for uh, color correction and they obtained uh, more uh, smaller uh, constraints on uh, mass and radius on Newton's stars. And uh, one, one more thing that I would like to, uh, to talk to you today is uh, to check all this approach that I described by looking at different sources to look at one single source and that, that is very essential because in this case you do not have problems with distances and so on. So this transience is very unique because it, it creates all kind of things that we know about Newton stars. It creates all kind of behavior on the color color diagram, so I will not talk much about this one. Uh, and uh, it has also thermonuclear bursts and this thermonuclear burst has a photospheric radius expansion. That is very uh, helpful for our, for our uh, Okay, let us take, uh, take only optical thick emission from this source and uh, I put here this flux and uh, hard color and uh, these are all spectra that uh, we, you can take from this source in, in the optical thick regime. You can create the same uh, spectra from uh, variability patterns. So at this frequency, at this frequency, at this, at this frequency and you see here that and the model here is the same that I applied model in the previous sources. So you see that, again, uh, the spectrum uh, only at lowest frequency here where uh, uh, you see that uh, accretion disk components start to contribute. Um, then we can look at different places on the color color diagram and we see that there are special region about the hardness. So this hard color about the unity is some, some, something special uh, for the source. And why it is that? It's essentially this hardness corresponds to the hardness of the spreading layer. And we see here again, uh, this is one spectrum, there's another spectrum, another spectrum, and this component is the same for everything. Okay, great. Uh, why uh, it is nice to have a photospheric radius expansion? Because in this case we exactly know that this effective temperature corresponds to adding to local adding to flux. Because in this case, pressure of radiation uh, really exceeds the gravity and we, we can anticipate that the color temperature should be the same as in the case of our spreading layer, or at least very similar. Uh, <clears throat> here are spectra uh, of, uh, uh, of a source just before photospheric radius expansion started, like uh, 0.1 second before. And here is the spectrum of the boundary layer. And you see that this, this color temperature essentially depends on, on, uh, on the hardness in this uh, part. It's very signal. So you see this, the same models applied for both, for both spectrum. Uh, and uh, just uh, a, bit, uh, a bit more uh, uh, spectral shape of the, same, of the same component. You see that uh, this is a frequency resolved emission of the sparingly layer that we inferred from variability analysis. This is the spectrum that we infer from this point, this is spectrum from this point, and the same model applied for everything. So you see that the spectrum is very similar and uh, uh, this supports our uh, interpretation that uh, we 
So this way we can extract information about the spreading layer. And uh, in the perspective for with other sources, you see that they're very similar. So uh, I'm come, come to my summary. My summary is that energy spectrum of the spreading layer is, is a very important tool to measure mass and radius and Newton stuff. Important is that it seems to we understand this physics. It's uh, we are not at the final stage, of course, because there are complications due to centrifugal uh, support that exists in the spreading layer. Uh, there is uh, some distribution of uh, of parameters that is possible because spreading layer is not uniform. It should be changing its uh, rotational velocity, one latitude, and so on. But it seems to be we understand its its major uh, constituents. That the composition of energy spectrum into accretion disk and spreading layer, it seems that we more or less understand how to do this. Free of frequency resolved energy spectra is a great tool to do this now. And uh, maximum color temperature doesn't vary over what we show right now without any, uh, any uh, disambiguities on uh, source distances. But we show that uh, maximum color temperature doesn't vary over more than a factor of 20 variation in the flux. And this strongly supports the theoretical model of anagamons. Yeah. So elaboration of this model, I think, will provide solid ground for accurate measurement of the star radio. Thank you for your attention. Questions? Yes, here. Like, you know, I'm part of that paper. But can you show the previous slide about the power magnet flux magnet, the third one? Uh, no, 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 yeah, here on the one? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because uh, we see that uh, when for different fluxes, you have this uh, one, three, and four. Uh -huh. the, the spectrum is very similar. What happens when uh, the spectrum is softer? Because the, the, so the same flux, we are going also down. Because then there is a rich in this component. What's happening in those uh, places? That's, uh, that's another story. <laughs> the story from the point of view that uh, it seems that the, all uh, Newton stars here do something. So there is some geometrical reconstruction of the region. What we do see is that uh, at this point, like only spreading layer remains by some I don't know why. Uh, I can make some interpretation, but it's not finalized yet. So, uh, source behaves like this. So, it goes here, it does this, and then this, and this. So, it behaves. What is the reason? We're still working on this. But what we can interpret from, from our approach is that here we have a spreading layer only, almost. Here the contribution of the disk is maximum, and here is some average contribution of the efficient disk, one, one to one, as we should expect in an in ordinary case. So here is the contribution of our disk and the boundary layer to the same luminosity. Here the contribution of disk is much larger than, than the boundary layer. Maybe because it somehow uh, becomes thicker and, color, and uh, cover some part of the boundary layer. I do not know, I do not have a complete uh, model for this. What's the time scale going up and down? Here? Every single point is 100 seconds. Yeah. So it really goes up and yeah. down? So it's it's never jump, right? it never jumps, no. no. Is it up? Down. Up and down. Okay. It's like 3,000 seconds. Yeah. Three. Uh, are you as sensitive as other um, approaches to the chemical composition or doesn't matter? Chemical? Uh, Sensitive from the point of view of theory of, of uh, when you estimate when you plot the rich yeah sure of course yeah. that's the same the temperature is, uh, is uh, uh, color correction is the same physics the same physics more questions yes uh, can you tell something about the equation of state soft when the radius of instant star is slow and uh, it's inside the uh, no right now I cannot I can say it's, it's some Equation of state. Uh, our uh, our approach is just started from the point of view that it's not here. yet finalized. There are some uh, limitations here, ah, so. but uh, the radius is more than yes. Yes, the uh, radius is more than ten kilometers, definitely. But then it's a question of composition because in the case of uh, spreading layer. Uh, and, uh, and for example, in the case of spreading layer and the burst, they might be different because spreading layer accretes matter like from a fresh. Uh, it goes with some composition, probably. Maybe it will sink immediately and will not uh, influence the photosphere, but in the case of burst, might be different. But it should be uh, explored more thoughtfully. Other questions? 
have a short question. Uh, what uh, do you think happens during the burst with this, this uh, spreading layer? Does it disappear? Because, I mean, this, this is a material that... Uh, That's the direct uh, relation with the previous talk. So it, it can disappear for some time, but uh, the point is that the mass accretion rate here is so large that it very fast can, can resume. Right, of course, but then, then you should much faster than you settle your photosol. That's the point. Uh, so even the spreading towards the poles will happen faster than the setting of the photosol. It depends on the model. I don't know. I mean, uh, technically, M dot is uh, uh, the pressure of the of the incoming matter is much higher than the photosphere. Mm -hmm. So therefore, you can go inside even when photosphere is. No, but I mean lateral spreading, like the, how how much the covering pressure varies, how, where is, how it. much luminosity of this spreading layer would change. The point is that we don't know how long it happens. Uh, what we know that the rotational speed is high, but how long it happens uh, towards the poles, I don't know. Have a follow-up question? We have ultra-compact binaries where we know that there is no height. Okay, exactly. So there should be some difference in the spreading layer spectrum. No, no, no. no. no, no. Uh, uh, about uh, at all uh, hydrogen, it's like bulk hydrogen is absent, but maybe even a couple of percent hydrogen is okay. For, for, uh, but uh, the question was, do you see any difference from uh, no, the spectrum of no. the ultra At least, uh, it's, if it's uh, present, the difference is not that, uh, that large. So, so I have, I have so 80 to 20. One of the, yeah. 80 to 20. But the sensitivity of this particular approach is not that large, because uh, it's frequency resolved, it, re it uh, uses only like percents of data. So therefore, uh, sensitivity with like 10-15% uh, in temperature is not, not bad. Okay, uh, I think that's enough. Uh, let's thank our speaker again. <laughs> our next speaker is uh, Lev Hitarchuk, who will tell us uh, about observational signatures of a black hole and neutron stars.
Anyway, this is the difference. Now, because we are in memorial uh, meeting, and I want to, uh, to mention about uh, Yakub Boris Zildovich, who made a big contribution, initiated this work by company aids. And this uh, paper in appendix, in fact, uh, Dyakov, I guess, Dyakov, uh, uh, who died uh, uh, very soon after that uh, paper, even, it was a report, it's not the paper, paper appears in 1956, and Yakov Borisovich told us that Dyakov died before this. And Dyakov, in fact, in this paper, in appendix, suggests a solution for bounded medium, he said, solution which is obtained by the companies should be convolved with for, um, in order to obtain solution of this, uh, uh, for uh, um, bounded medium, you should convolve solution for uh, uh, Cauchy problem, which is presented in the paper by companies. With this exponent. It's, but uh, solution was not there, and I was very surprised when we obtained the solution to see, to some extent, answer to this question. And this, uh, I presented evidence of it. Also, I mentioned about Yakov uh, Borisovich after, in, in, in relation with the uh, paper by uh, Ola Shakura and Yakov Borisovich. So, another surprising thing. It has nothing to do with this great spectrum. This income distribution in the United States and in Great Britain. And this distribution is similar to continuation spectrum. Absolutely the same. Some kind of soft component and power. Is it uh, just excellent? It's, uh, uh, it's not, uh, you see, there is uh, really some uh, uh, solid uh, stuff behind us. This distribution is really similar to condensation spectrum. This soft component, which uh, is related to people who are not making a lot of money, this is number or photon number in our sense, and this is energy, energy or money, or money, and you have power. Condensation power. Only a relatively small uh, number of people make a lot of money. And I'll demonstrate you right away. Okay. <laughs> Fine. Anyway, when I put this in appendix to the paper, uh, Richard really liked this very much. He said, okay, some guy is real. He wants to make uh, some relation. Life. Anyway, this is another feature which is uh, characterized radiation for, from uh, compact object, in this case neutral star, you see uh, almost uh, 10 order of magnitude. And you see this uh, so-called uh, white noise and then power and then another. So this is uh, objective information. And uh, even from general point of view, you see this is a signature of compact region in this, uh, in, uh, for this object, and this is signature in, in terms of time scale of accretion disk. This is for signal 6-1, similar story, similar story, but this is uh, part is not pronounced. Anyway, and this is uh, general evolution of power spectrum, in this case, power spectrum multiplied by frequency, and you see from how this power spectrum evolved from low hat state to soft state. All features are disappeared, and this is a break frequency. Anyway, and this is the comparison, what is going on with 1650. We put here uh, uh, energy spectrum, this energy spectrum, and the power spectrum. And when energy becomes softer, uh, this uh, frequency is uh, getting uh, larger, larger. Anyway, and when index uh, goes up, uh, this uh, uh, 
particular frequency disappear. This is the objective information. This circle sex one for the index. So if you feed data of circle sex one using continuation model, you can make uh, this uh, uh, picture of what an index versus time. And this we collect data with uh, um, Nikolai Shapnikov from 1996 to 2006. And you see photon index, uh, if photon index is related to, um, uh, related to hazards of spectrum, we see how uh, from soft state you're going to local state, it takes uh, an, uh, to soft state quantity. Anyway, okay. This we collect here how spectral index is changing, uh, photon index, photon index changing with quasi periodic oscillation frequency, and this uh, for 1915 uh, 1515, and uh, this also observations. And what is uh, interesting here, uh, you see it's uh, very wide plateaus and increase and then uh, saturation of index. This observation. And uh, photon index versus break frequency. And this is a picture what we can make from uh, previous uh, plots. So uh, source evolved from low cut state uh, to high source state, and the compact uh, region becomes smaller because high uh, frequency, uh, QPO frequency increases. This can be um, a picture obtained from all these. Uh, observational results. Uh, this uh, uh, index, uh, spectral index versus <coughs> electron temperature, what we obtained with Rubin Farinelli, and we found for a uh, number of sources, uh, spectral index is around uh, one, but with bigger numbers. Anyway, this is uh, 1728 typical spectra. In fact, uh, temperature for 1728 changing quite uh, a lot from 3 kV to 20 kV and uh, we obtain analyzing data with Elena Seifina we found for uh, this uh, for 1728 index stays the same temperature changing but the index of uh, continuation spectra uh, stayed around one uh, around two or spectral length around one anyway uh, this is uh, another, uh, it depends of mass accretion rate or uh, normalization or containerization fraction. And this is a histogram value of photon index depending on index and you see index almost uh, uh, concentrated around. Uh, this is another story related to, um, uh, related to um, uh, work by uh, Kora uh, Shakura and Yakov Borisovich, and we use uh, this uh, uh, model. Uh, so this is a Q Corona energy release in uh, uh, transition layer. This is precisely what uh, or boundary layer, whatever you, you call. And this is uh, energy release, and this is Compton cooling. Just we consider only Compton cooling. Okay, okay. So and then from these relations. Uh, taking average uh, intensity, we obtain this uh, equation. Uh, so this, if you say uh, Q disk is much more than Q corona, from this relation, you have immediately index. Index, because index depends on uh, ratio. Uh, ratio B over theta. B, beta is this, uh, uh, it's 1 over tau square. It's uh, related to an eigenvalue problem. And uh, temperature of this uh, uh, dimensionless temperature, <coughs> and you see if Q disk uh, over Q corona much less than one, you have index around one. This is precisely what we obtain. This is another example for this our recent paper with Elena Seifina on uh, square x1. We see index stay uh, the same around two and then two. It's another story. So and now we talk about uh, this, uh, I talk about uh, spectral index related to um, uh, income distribution. So main idea is it's uh, related also to 
я там борюсь идеи, density of, uh, of the spectra is uh, power of uh, probability of scattering. At each scattering you have uh, change of uh, energy as a one plus eta, and finally you have this uh, uh, power. power. And here is the same for uh, uh, income distribution, because uh, uh, number of uh, amount of money what you have is probability of scattering, it's, uh, this is what you gain every year, for example, and finally you have distribution as a power. The same idea. Okay, now platform was determination, uh, just I uh, can talk about this, it's related to QPO frequency what we observe, it's velocity divided size, and so it's, uh, if you take a difference in the frequency, uh, log difference of logarithm, you have a logarithm for a given uh, index, you have uh, uh, logarithm of uh, uh, ratio of mass. This is very simple idea, very simple idea, and this is how index is related to number of scattering and efficiency. It does matter, thermal continuation, it's always uh, this formula. Uh, I, I divided continuation parameter. It's number of scattering in the case of converging flow. The case of converging flow. It's proportional tau. Hot photons produce only in the direction of motion. In the case of uh, converging flow, eta efficiency is 1 over tau. Therefore, you should expect uh, saturation. This is precisely what we see. This is precisely what we see. And then scaling. Scaling. This for 1950, uh, 1655. Scaling index distribution QPO frequency. And this we see uh, shift uh, of this. It's related to mass. Shifting one correlation versus another give you mass of GRS 1915. Uh, and uh, so this is another story with Sigmund 6 1. Many points, but one parameter, the whole mass. This is another point, this is the accuracy of this uh, uh, determination. And this is example for GRS 339, so index versus uh, black hole, norma black hole uh, normalization, uh, mass accretion rate, normalization with the mass, mass accretion rate, index versus QPO frequency, and uh, this is uh, for 1915, you see very powerful, this, uh, we should consider this one, uh, very powerful uh, saturation plateau. So this is precisely observation evidence of what, what I told you. For a high mass accretion rate, you should expect index saturation, because index is inverse proportional continuation parameter. Continuation parameter is product of a uh, number of scattering multiplied by efficiency, and this goes to constant. This is precisely what we see in observation. This is a signature, what already I demonstrated you, signature of neutron star, constancy of index, and for black hole, it's observational. Index increases and then saturates. So this is another story for 1743. So you see here, it's saturation. Uh, saturation and this is for 1543 index increase and saturate very long plateau very long plateau and uh, this uh, black hole uh, mass determination for 061 so this is uh, this for 1728 uh, we compare with black holes this precisely picture when we can uh, compare black holes and uh, black holes here and the neutron star. So and this is new result. This is new result. What produced in the Sietina for ULX M101. This is precisely for you. We see index increase and such precisely like in 1915. And now using the same method we can determine mass. Of course with some certainty this is uh, uh, 
uh, M one on one you let what is it plus four or not. But the same behavior, this is blue point, we combine with three sources here, three sources, 1550 and we found what? Uh, about uh, uh, 7.1024 solar masses. Solar masses. So the, the same methods can be applied for NGC 4051 and uh, this evolution for 1630 we have uh, the same as our recent paper, index saturation, and I think it's enough for today. <laughs> this way is enough. So, uh, I think. Uh, okay, new methods of evaluation of black hole mass using absorbable index QPO frequency and mass attrition rate in soft state. Index QPOM job correlate shows saturation of photon index at high value of low frequency index saturation is observation evidence of existence of converging flow. Because index is an inverse proportional compensation parameter. So, and on the other hand, the neutral star spectrum index doesn't vary and stay almost uh, spectrum, uh, uh, almost about one. That's it. Thank you.
So this telescope took part in spectroscopy of these famous objects. Uh, their luminosity, X-ray luminosity, is uh, higher than 10 to 39 arc a second. This M82. Uh, you will like say, John, uh, yesterday Fjord Harrison showed us that there is probably here ULX2 uh, pulsar, but ULX1 10 to 41 at the second here. So 15 years ago it was they were discovered by Chandra and maybe first 10 years people thought that they are intermediate mass black holes to increase luminosity range and maybe five last years people think that uh, they are supercritical attraction disks like that in SES-43 and geometrical collimation is needed to increase the luminosity in spite the uh, supercritical attraction disk is extremely, extremely bright we need geometrical collimation so because uh, we cannot decide between these two ideas simply we need optical data as the most uh, uh, effective tool because uh, each point which we are what we observe in ULX is maybe interpreted uh, as an intermediate mass black hole <coughs> SS433 like objects, supercritical accretion disks with the, around star mass black holes. It's the first telescope, it's our Russian telescope, six meter, six meter telescope. We could not take spectra of very faint objects in the second and the third magnitude, but you can study nebula, and so we, and not only we, of course, uh, people found uh, that the nebula around this UL-axis, around the ul axis are not supernova remnants. They are much bigger and much stronger, much more powerful. So, uh, it, it, they discovered some um, <coughs> motions inside this nebula, like dynamical perturbed, uh, motions and also uh, what we know now that using the Zanstra methods and uh, studying the thermal uh, ionization state of the nebula we need powerful ultramus, uh, powerful ultraviolet sources. Second uh, is my colleagues uh, Shikiro Ueda, Alexander Vinakurov and Tony Sholokhov we studied with Subaru for Subaru telescope uh, for <coughs> ULX is well known and we have found that all these ULXs have the same spectra. So there is a very strong helium 2 line and the Chalpa line. Uh, I'll show just uh, again helium 2 and the Chalpa and our full spectrum. So there is a helium 2 line, the Chalpa, H beta line and helium 2 again. So it's a very hot wind what we observed there. <coughs> it's again, I'll show the numbers later. So what we found and we, uh, what we what we found that uh, H alpha line is broader than helium 2 line in each the object and average uh, width of the of these lines of these lines about 1000 uh, kilometer seconds and we added all published other data and have found that all the spectra look the same. So what people took the spectra uh, even if it took, uh, take spectra, uh, all spectra are the same, and the spectra show uh, the type, the type of the spectral type, like WR, uh, Wolfright star, uh, nitrogen uh, lake, Wolfright nitrogen, Wolfright star, or LVV star in the hot uh, contract state. So LVV stars uh, show the same, uh, the same behavior as. X-ray uh, <coughs> sources, so they have two states, uh, low, uh, hard, and high, uh, and high state. <coughs> anyway, uh, all the spectra to show, to show the state. And also, two, year, two, two, two months ago, uh, we took spectrum one more, ULX, uh, with very well-known uh, counterpart, and again, we have seen this uh, helium-2. Helium to light. So it's all spectroscopy. What I know for the moment, and all the spectra, all these objects 
have the same uh, type of reference starts W N starts O N D V starts O S S plus T S S plus T star uh, spectrum very similar to all these stars. So they all <coughs> must constitute a homogeneous class object. So first conclusion. And other objects like Sigma 63, and there are actually this object what left shown house. Uh, they are not actually ULSs. They are not have such strong luminosity. Uh, they are average luminosity uh, like uh, 30, 30 times less than uh, in ULSs. So we try to understand the spectra, and we have understood, understood them <coughs> using different different stellar templates. So they are spectra of very hot winds, O2, O3, on all sides, uh, classification WN5 or 6. It's a Krauter diagram. It's helium 2 line. It, uh, the width of the helium 2 line is a, <coughs> it's a uh, terminal velocity of the wind. And and here, you are left here. Yes, this is here. You are left here. Yes, uh -huh. <coughs> and here is equivalent width of the line. So the, the powerful power of the mass loss rate, yes? So, it's a WN consistence, and here we show LBV uh, transitionals, hot state here, and this LBV, AG Carina, hot state here, this LBV, and hot state is famous LBV, 59 <coughs> So, our units move here, and they change uh, we have uh, we had three successive nights from here to here to here. So their behavior nothing like stars. They change uh, uh, expansion velocity, the wind velocity, a few times. It's again uh, uh, radial velocity curve. We cannot use them to uh, to to find masses because they are change spontaneously. So if the spectrum is W and L spectrum, it's just a donor star. It's impossible because the wind fet accretion uh, very not effective. It's not effective. But we need to, to we need to understand it at 40 second. And also what I told in the last slide that uh, night to night variability nothing like star. Change everything. <coughs> If it is a radiative aggression disk, probably not, because we know examples. Every example, what we know, uh, this here, this, this by Roberto Sawyer, and uh, cataclysmic variable, not magnetic, cataclysmic variables, uh, in each of them, in outbars, the helium 2 line is broader than the chalk line, like it must be in aggression disk, yes? In our situation, opposite situation, like in this type of stars called SS-23 winds. In SS-23 wind, uh, HL line is broader. And also, supercritical aggression is the third possibility. But again, if it is the case, SS-23 must be unique because uh, lines of these ULX objects uh, 12 times fainter, fainter in hydrogen and helium-2 and 2 times fainter in helium-2. So it's not such, such powerful means. It's observations and it's luminosities for five. It's luminosities. So uh, we find here what we find here that if we have subcritical accretion, yes. So mass accretion rate, that, uh, so X-ray luminosity does depend on mass accretion rate. In supercritical accretion, it's not the case because the supercritical accretion. X-ray luminosity doesn't change just logarithmically, but the walls uh, and the wind, so the wind is stronger, and so the luminosity will depend on <coughs> will depend on uh, <coughs> mass accretion rate. So it's our second conclusion that they similar to SS-43, but again SS-43 is unique, and there all the uh, mass accretion rates fainter than uh, we get, and Comparatively, uh, consequently, the temperature, the wind temperature is higher. It's my, my last, my last, a few last uh, slides. It's uh, uh, this 
Вот, мы знаем, без Юрий Плотин, он замах Валерия Франшова, Ольга Шолохова, мы стали антенна Галакси. Из панорамы спектра, где ULSS и антенна Галакси. Вот мы found, мы have found that all ULSS screen points are nearby to clusters. And так, actually, we have used sub-ULX, sub-ULX objects, which are brighter than neutron star, but maybe, but less than ULS has less luminosity. And we have found that all this, all this clusters nearby with the ULX, as we say, we observe have five, six, have age less than five million years. The same we have found using VLC in this galaxy, also star forming galaxy, interacting galaxy, two galaxies, two nuclei, and two galaxies are here. And in this case it was easier because we found in spectra that uh, all these clusters which ULS belong to uh, have Helium 2 emission, so they are very young, less than four million years. It's a separation between clusters in this galaxy and this galaxy, clusters and, <coughs> uh, and the ULX. So our, our astrometry is very nice and we found in antenna galaxy, we found that it's, it's not occasional, it's not occasional, uh, the, the situation. So we have found all ULXs, uh, all ULXs nearby to very young clusters. And this uh, dis uh, displacement is about 200 parsecs. So uh, we may understand this situation only in the case if your legs are still on mass black holes and they are very young population, belong to very young population because 100 solar mass evolved for, for 3 million, million, million years. Yes? And we have to understand this situation with the cluster age must be less than, uh, not, uh, not, not less than, it's my probably last slide, not less than, <coughs> than the evolution of the UL axis. And we discussed the, this situation because the cluster age at least has to be a primary evolution, secondary evolution, plus transportation time, yes? But if you take a um, idea that uh, in supernova, in binary system supernova, uh, because of momentum loss or because of kick, because of neutrino kick, uh, <coughs> we will discuss uh, the situation. We, in any case, we will have at a time, we will have a time for transportation and for evolution. So, uh, the only idea that we may understand the rejection of the binaries from the cluster. <coughs> and so we confirm the current cluster model evolution because, because if you take our galaxy, we can't understand, uh, there is, uh, this problem is very, very well known. We can't understand which star or which cluster, because maybe 30 degrees between the cluster and between star, runaway star, for instance, yes? And if you take antenna galaxy, it's very clear, it's, it's cluster, this is star, this cluster, this Thank you. Yes. Could you comment the recent discovery of the Parsar in UH in F82 by Duskar? I don't know, but I may <laughs> pass it to Kosti Pasnov. Konstantin Pasnov told me that it's not unusual probably, it's maybe normal, but I don't know why and how it can, I, I don't understand the situation so far. Other questions? Do you have a, a time resolved uh, optical observations of, uh, let's say, other uh, ULXs for which you might be able to detect uh, the pulsations like uh, for this uh, ULX in M82? Or such high very new idea that you are presenting to us. So, uh, I know the <coughs> paper by Shakura in Lipunov and 1980, when they suggested that the uh, assessed photometry could be the same, 
assessment field is a neutron star, very strong magnetic field. And this uh, works just uh, uh, um, 0.01 second is falling down and falling time to four times. Yes? And after that, this uh, funnel, magnetic funnel, became free. It looks just a, just a gun, yes? And so you may <coughs> try to study fast variability here of this pulsar. But probably it looks like very, it's very stable. I mean, very stable. Yes. Yes. Rotation, so it's hard. I can repeat it. Yes, sir. Yeah, I would not, uh, thank you very much for the talk, but I would not discard yet the supernova model because there are several high mass X ray binaries in our galaxy which are close to 100 kilometers. So the QV norma is a three day orbit high mass X ray binary, it has an excess velocity of about 100, and 1700 minus 37 is something like 70 kilometers per second. So I think you could do it with both models there. I agree, we need 70, 80 kilometers per second, but we have at the time of pre-supernova evolution, so it must be go before, it must be expected, ejected before, because we have this? only 3 million years. Yeah, but 3 million is enough for a high mass X-ray environment, because the companion is rejuvenated. Okay, and Edward, we need uh, time for transportation. Yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, if there are no more questions, uh, let's uh, thank our speaker again. There was a slight change in the program, and the next talk will be given by uh, Sergei Popov, who will tell us about initial parameters and uh, evolution of uh, neutron stars. Okay. Um, so uh, I'm going to talk about neutron stars, and uh, this work was done in collaboration with Andrei Gosh and Robert Torola. Uh, I'm lucky, I guess, to show the first PPD diagram in the conference. Um, uh, so it shows that there is a diversity of young neutron stars. Uh, there are magnetars, and maybe I would agree with you earlier that they are the most interesting neutron stars in the sky. Uh, still, radio pulsars are the most numerous. And so I'm going to speak about radio pulsars. Uh, in particular, uh, to study evolution of neutron stars, very often, well, nearly every time it's necessary to know the age. And the ages are mostly unknown. The unique chance is to find a neutron star in a supernova remnant, for which uh, we can have an independent estimate of the age. And so uh, we used uh, neutron stars, radio pulsars mostly, in supernova remnants to uh, derive uh, initial spin periods of these objects. So we looked through the literature and collected up, to our knowledge, the largest set of such uh, pairs, uh, pulsars plus neutron stars, 30 pairs. So for uh, supernova remnants, we have uh, independent estimates uh, of age. Then we can use it to derive initial skin periods uh, for radio pulsars. So I'll skip the uh, table and show it on the block. So periods are on the horizontal axis. In many, I would say in most cases, we really derived some estimate for the initial skin period. The main assumption is that um, the breaking index is equal to 3. Uh, it is not true for many young pulsars, as we know, but it should be alright on average. And uh, for some sources, we uh, were not able to derive uh, the, an estimate of the initial spin period, either because uh, the uh, estimate of the age of the supernova remnant uh, was not very precise, or simply the result was uh, in correspondence with the assumption of zero spin period and this crosses with the errors they indicate upper limits on uh, initial spin periods. Uh, this is quite interesting. However, uh, unfortunately, even with these 30 pairs, uh, it's very difficult to plot the distribution. There is not enough data. Uh, and uh, the knowledge of initial spin periods is very important in many studies in population synthesis of neutron stars, for example. And uh, what we can do, we can confront our data 
uh, with some popular assumptions. Uh, now the most standard assumption, I would say, is uh, to assume that the initial spin periods have Gaussian distribution. And uh, we didn't try to fit, again, because in our opinion it's a little bit premature. Uh, but if we take something beautiful, 0 0.1 uh, is the average spin period and uh, uh, sigma also 0 0.1 second, then it is mostly in correspondence with the data we have. So such assumptions, in our opinion, are in good correspondence with the data on radio pulsars in supernova remnants. However, there is another approach, now also very popular, because maybe I can go back one slide. Where is the page up? Here. Uh, there are several sources which are not actually radio pulsars, they are compact X-ray sources inside supernova remnants, which uh, have very long spin periods, and they are very young objects. So you can also uh, imagine that they have very low magnetic fields, but even for standard magnetic fields there are objects with relatively large spin periods, like hundreds of milliseconds. So uh, now we're, very often people assume a very broad distribution in initial spin periods. Uh, for example, if we take the flat distribution between milliseconds and half a second, uh, it looks like it's not in good correspondence with the data on radio pulsars and supernova remnants. Okay. So we probably have an idea of initial spin periods for radio pulsars, uh, but our result was challenged by a recent paper by Moses and collaborators. Uh, they used a different approach. Uh, they used kinematic ages for radio pulsars. And uh, the advantage is that they can have not 20 something objects, uh, but they can have up to 100, so they can increase the statistics significantly. But on the other hand, the kinematic age is something less uncertain than the supernova random age. And uh, they attain the distribution of this shape. This is Gaussian 0 0.1, 0 0.1. Uh, and uh, so it is very easy to explain this part. So, because we, we don't insist that it is 0 0.1, 0 0.1. Uh, it can be slightly broader, slightly shifted. Uh, but there is a problem with this tail. Either it's a second population or something is going wrong. Uh, what can be uh, wrong here? Uh, again, our objects in supernova remnants are very young. Typical ages below 10,000 years. In this sample, which is large, typical ages are about 1 million years. Significantly longer. Uh, what can be the difference? The difference can be, uh, can be related to magnetic field decay. We can do such a trick. Uh, let us focus on the right figure. Uh, let us take purely Gaussian distribution of initial spin periods. Uh, generate a synthetic sample of radio pulsars, run the population synthesis code, uh, obtain some evolved pulsar population, observe the evolved pulsar population, so we put all selection effects, etc., etc., and then we recalculate initial spin periods using the same simple formula which was used, by the way, also by Nutsus and collaborators. That's nice. Uh, okay. Uh, and, of course, here we assume that there is no magnetic field decay. And then, when we reconstruct, we obtain uh, something which is shown in the histogram. We obtain this long tail. So, magnetic field decay can mimic the uh, different shape of uh, the initial spin period distribution. I can show it in a different way. Uh, so, magnetic field, spin period, uh, if we use the naive way to reconstruct the initial spin periods uh, like it was done by Moses and collaborators, we obtain these estimates. Uh, these six largest values which form the second population, the tail in the plot uh, from their paper. However, uh, if we assume that there was a moderate field decay, then objects are shifted as it is shown by errors. Different errors for the same object, they simply reflect the uncertainty in the kinematic age, which was given by Moses and uh, his co-authors. And we clearly see that even moderate magnetic field decay can do such a trick. So then we can ask ourselves, is it really working? Uh, so here, uh, a little bit in advance, I said that this shift is incident with the radio pulsar data. Uh, now I'm going to come to the main part. Uh, with uh, some recent results uh, published yet, in which we uh, tried to probe the magnetic field decay in the radio pulsar population. Uh, the idea um, put forward by Andrei Goshev uh, is the following. We take more
more or less uh, the known uh, pulsar current technique, which was developed years ago. And, uh, but we don't study the flow of pulsars along the period line. We study the flow of pulsars using characteristic ages. Somehow it is better, because if we look at a track with significant magnetic field decay, uh, so this is the track, the straight line is the um, track on the digital diagram for constant magnetic field, and breaking index 3, so classical formula. Uh, if we add exponential field decay with a relatively short time scale, we have this term. So period is not growing, so the flow, the current, flows, the current stops. Uh, however, even for this object, the characteristic age continues to grow because uh, period is the same, but uh, period derivative is decreasing. And uh, this is an advantage, we can use this method. Uh, so we study distribution and characteristic ages, uh, compare it in a sense with a case with no field decay and try to derive parameters of the decaying field. We did extensive tests. Uh, it took some time. At first, we used a population synthesis code uh, by Andrei Goshev. Then, uh, Spanish uh, colleagues uh, provided a set of models uh, generated with a more advanced uh, population synthesis code, and that's the result of tests. Uh, here, a red thick uh, solid line shows the actual field decay used to generate a synthetic. Uh, sample of pulsars in the code. And um, dashed and dotted lines, they show reconstruction of the magnetic field decay, so H is uh, along the horizontal axis. I guess you can't read, but it is 10 to 5 years and uh, 10 to 5.6 years. Uh, we have two different curves because we actually, in reality, finally we want to come to observational data, we don't know the initial distribution of periods and magnetic fields. We have to make assumptions. And these two reconstructions uh, in each model, they correspond to different assumptions about initial parameters. So we see that if the field is constant, then actually we find that the field is nearly not evolving. In one case, we even obtain that it is slightly growing, but the uncertainty here is like 20% maybe. Uh, so it's inside the uncertainty of the map. For the best model uh, generated by uh, Jose Pons and his collaborators, uh, we surprisingly got nearly perfect coincidence uh, between the uh, actual decay rate used in the population synthesis code and the uh, shape of the reconstructed decay um, curve. So, uh, after these tests, we assumed we came to the conclusion that the method is working and so we applied it to the actual set of radio pulsars. The point is that when we uh, deal with real pulsars there are many 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 selection effects. So we studied in which range of ages we can use our method and it came out that without significant assumptions uh, the range of ages is very strict. In terms of characteristic ages, spin down ages, it's roughly from 10 to 5 to 10 to 6. In terms of real ages, uh, it's even smaller, uh, say from 80,000 years up to 400,000 years. And so we took the largest samples of uh, radio pulsars. The largest is the ATNA catalog, from which, of course, we excluded magnetars, uh, recycled pulsars, pulsars in binaries, globular clusters, and so on. So we saved only standard pulsars. Even uh, we reduced this large sample by taking just pulsars uh, found in parks, multi beam survey and swing burden survey. So uh, this sample is more uniform. And analyzing these two samples, we derived these decay curves. So this is the real true age now, so 10 to 5 years and uh, 5.6 for the logarithm uh, of the age. And in this uh, during this period, uh, the field roughly decays by a factor of two, according to our method. And if we feed it with an exponential decay, uh, then the characteristic scale for decay uh, is like uh, 0.4 gigahertz. Uh, on one hand, it's a lot. So definitely, uh, we can't say that uh, this rapid, I would say, decay 
lasts during the whole lifetime of the radial pulsars. It looks like this is a period in a radial pulsar's life in which field decays relatively rapidly. It has a physical explanation. Uh, we didn't make tests because we don't have uh, a good code for magnetic field decay in our hands. But uh, magnetic field decay in radial pulsars is sensitive to the temperature of a neutron star. So it is easier to uh, decrease the field when a neutron star is young and hot. And after, say, one million years, the field uh, decays much more slowly, simply because uh, the resistivity is lower, uh, the conductivity is higher. And uh, so it looks like we are lucky with this method to pinpoint this period of rapid field decay. And uh, as I showed it, uh, it's not only interesting by itself, but it helps to solve many other problems uh, related to initial parameters of neutron stars. So these are actually my conclusions. So uh, we collected a large set of pairs, supernova remnants and radio pulsars, and used it to derive the uh, initial spin periods. I mean, cannot say initial spin period distribution, but we can confront popular models and we find that uh, now popular uh, relatively narrow Gaussians are in good correspondence with these results. Then we demonstrated that the, uh, the second population of uh, radio pulsars uh, with uh, probably large initial spin periods can find explanation uh, in the framework of the K-Matet field and they come from the same current initial spin period distribution. And finally, uh, we uh, modified the pulsar current analysis to probe the magnetic field decay in neutron stars and found that uh, for ages roughly 100,000 years, 400,000 years, uh, field decays uh, by a factor of two. That's all. Thank you. Questions to Sergey? Yes? There is uh, the system is two pulsars different ages. So from this system you can estimate that decay decay time for, for, for magnetic field independence. So uh, you do, you no, do you mean the double pulsar? Yeah. No, but the, in the double pulsar the second one, oh, say the first one is the millisecond recycle pulsar with completely different history. <laughs> so for millisecond well, pulsar... The age is very different, so if we can estimate... Yeah, yeah, but... Uh, in the standard picture, the field decay in millisecond pulsars is due to accretion. It's not the just decay of the field in the crust. So physics should be different, unfortunately, we can't use it. Yes, Fiona? for the time 
time scale, like one million year, that can be an important issue. But for such old pulsars, there are, I would say, no very good measurements of breaking distance. Unfortunately, it's harder to do for the older ones. So. Hmm? Sorry, it's louder. harder, unfortunately, to do for the older ones, I guess. Mm, yeah. But this is also the, time, the age range where your conclusions uh, lie. So if something happens to the breaking index, it might actually... Yeah, but by the way, if the field is decaying, something happens to the breaking index, definitely. So it's, it can be the same. You know? so the last thing I got to think about the same is that we will try to get the, to compare different models for the initial distribution of pulsars mm -hmm. and compare to the extra emission from uh, millisecond <coughs> or young pulsars mm -hmm. uh, that you would expect in the young supernova, right? or like basically like just immediately after the supernova, uh, like the extra source, mm -hmm. when it becomes optically thin. And so I think we, we got similar, like yeah. we, we didn't consider the pulse source, the radio pulse source at all, but we got like, the, for example, our Zoomerian distribution was really off because it, pro it produces like huge X-ray luminosity. Yeah, so too many short Yes, yeah, because yeah. they were too short, like mm -hmm. a few milliseconds, and then you would produce like 10 to 41 hours per second the X-ray pulse source, which no one could see. Because they, they do shine in a very short period of time, but still they are, they don't, I mean, you don't see this as a most function of X-ray source. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was wondering if, if, if we can uh, combine the constraints from radio pulsars with the constraints that comes from the X-ray sources, like uh, uh, from the from the most function at uh, the bright end. Yes, but really on the bright end, so on, on this part. For yes, sure, exactly. Well, yeah, for sure. Because for radio pulsar people, now it's, now it's more interesting what's happening here. Because people start to some people start to suspect that there are many neutron stars born with uh, long spin theories, long mean 0 0.4, say. and it was interesting to check. Yeah, but, but I agree generally. Yeah, it should be combined and used together at least in this part of the distribution. Okay, if there are no more questions. Uh, I suggest we first thank Sergey and then also all the speakers of the session for their interesting contributions and staying on time. Thank you very much.
Galaxy Galaxy and the X-ray sources, I I would concentrate on uh, 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 low mass X-ray binary sources because in uh, elliptical galaxies uh, which are assumed uh, that uh, have no uh, strong star formation currently, all the accretion power comes from the uh, star formation which occurred billions years ago, and uh, that's why the primary uh, sources which contribute to X-ray luminosity and to, uh, to particular sources which are observed in, in uh, elliptical galaxies are elements this. So, this is a famous cartoon and uh, there are no strong comment about that. Uh, I mean, there is an emission star and some low mass uh, companion which fills its Roche loop, accretion passes through the disk, and this is most powerful matter supply to the compact objects. Uh, and for instance, the wind accretion is much less less efficient in, in this um, low mass sources. So, and this is the picture which we uh, constructed together with Mike Nitsev a few years ago, which uh, in this plot shown here, uh, this is uh, a system galactic uh, low mass X-ray binaries, which we know uh, uh, orbital period of the binary system as a function of uh, X-ray luminosity on this um, here. And uh, there are several groups of sources in, uh, in this plot, and uh, uh, you see this is logarithmic plot, so actually the orbital periods are from uh, uh, fractions of hours until uh, uh, thousands of hours, so you, need to, you see that there is a uh, range of uh, orbital periods. And uh, uh, this uh, group of sources are presumably the uh, classical element space where, uh, where the um, optical low mass main sequence stars fit this Roche law. And these guys are uh, uh, the binaries where giant stars uh, already evolved start, uh, start fields in slow flow and the creation uh, proceeds again through the disk. And these are most luminous uh, persistent tax resources we see. Of course, there are these gray uh, sources. These gray sources uh, are white dwarfs. Uh, which fills its row slope at so called the outer contour of the uh, X ray binaries. But uh, um, um, this, the most bright of, of, of this uh, source fields uh, uh, is located inside the Doppler cluster. And we will consider uh, for a while the evolution of field, of field, of field binaries uh, where dynamic interactions are not important. So the motivation for the study was the uh, observation of. Uh, of, of evolution um, of, of X-ray luminosity, of the number, if you like, of X-ray sources in elliptical galaxies, which is very interesting. Uh, if you plot uh, the uh, X-ray luminosity observed per, per unit mass of uh, stellar mass of the galaxies, uh, uh, you would find that uh, this interesting law. I mean, the, the, the you see that the, the, this uh, quantity uh, almost doesn't change, not almost, but practically says constant this time. And uh, uh, this was an interesting fact, and people tried to understand it using the population synthesis model, and uh, one of uh, uh, claimed very good models, uh, they, they say they produced this curve, and uh, in their paper, they, they, these authors, um, stated that uh, there is a good agreement between the theory and observations, which are apparently not the case. Um, but still, uh, uh, there are some uh, attempts to, to, to reconcile the, the, these uh, models with observations, um, uh, but I'll say about it a bit later. But let's, uh, let's, uh, let me remind you briefly uh, the, uh, the evolution of the MXB, which is uh, the thing which is very important because uh, many interesting uh, objects like the greeting pulsars and the second pulsars uh, are, um, are recognized to be produced uh, through this evolutionary channel, the descendants of elements this. And uh, this is a well known cartoon of uh, how this evolution proceeds uh, for low mass X-ray binaries. And, uh, uh, it's, it's a pleasure to, to, to say thank you uh, to Hubble who was 
the among the first uh, people who realized the importance of these processes and uh, uh, was among the first designers of, of such as hymns of binary revolutions. Uh, important here is that you know, low mass stars, uh, and uh, of course to produce neutron stars you must have some high mass, and the second and uh, the primary star uh, which explodes as a supernova sooner or later, and uh, the secondary star is, uh, has a, a, a much smaller mass, and uh, after the first uh, Rosh Hashanah episodes, the most crucial uh, and poorly understood, I would say, uh, stage of, 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 of this scheme, of this entire scheme, occurs, uh, namely the common developed stage, where the, this is highly non-conservative stage, stage uh, pre, uh, and very short, and uh, calculations, many calculations show that it's pretty short, where the uh, a lot of angular momentum is lost from the from the from the from the system, and the uh, secondary star becomes becomes pretty close to the to the to the, uh, to, the to the core of the star, which explodes as a neutron uh, as a supernova, and so we have a very close binary system, and the evolution here is proceeds uh, through the loss of angular momentum through stellar wind or gravitational radiation, very well known scheme. So. Uh, the key parameters, as I already said, is that uh, the, the common male treatment and, uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, unlike, uh, say, uh, fundamental physics, we cannot, uh, we cannot write down uh, some conformal invariant Lagrangians or something like that to describe the evolution of real objects. And uh, we have to heavily rely on uh, some phenomenological uh, parameters. And uh, this parameter is, of course, the most uncertain, uh, but still uh, we try to do it, we try to fix it by, by, by comparing uh, the results of our expectations which what we really observe. The second important thing is the supernova kick velocity, uh, kick velocity of neutron star which, uh, which uh, neutron star acquires during supernova explosion, but uh, um, this uh, it can be fixed from, um, from uh, uh, comparison with uh, for all this uh, distri real distribution of pulsars, and it's also well, well known technique how to do that. And, uh, and there is a general agreement that uh, this kick more or less can be approximated more or less good by a Maxwellian function with some mean velocity of order of 200 or maybe 300 kilometers per second. So, uh, and, uh, and as, uh, I stress also that the important thing is the, Newton star, uh, the mass of the Newton star itself, uh, which, is, which, should, uh, which, which uh, turns out to be very important. So, uh, um, to, say, uh, say to, to, to calculate the evolution of uh, elements B, so usually, uh, and to compare this, say, these results or observations, uh, we can uh, take uh, some evolutionary code, and usually this is a population synthesis code because uh, to calculate a lot of binary systems you have um, you have to uh, um, you have to uh, you have to calculate a lot of uh, say one half one million of systems or something like that to, uh, to, to to obtain statistically significant results. So this so there are several uh, codes uh, developed by different groups and then gives more or less consistent results, but all of them have some subtleties. Uh, and what we did, uh, we have our own code and, uh, and uh, our implementation, our in contribution to this uh, code was uh, an addition of uh, evolution of neutron stars, uh, rotational uh, evolution of neutron stars and white boss with magnetic fields. So, the parameters, uh, evolutionary parameters, as I already said, that important thing is the neutron star mass, because uh, it, is, it, it, it is especially important for late stage of evolution when uh, mass transfer occurs from a secondary component onto the neutron star. And the general feeling is that uh, in the, the so-called um, electron capture supernova, uh, um, when, when, when the uh, neutron star is formed by electron captures in uh, uh, oxygen, neon, magnesium core, uh, this uh, situation may uh, take place from this range of stars. This is approximately the range, nobody knows precisely the ranges, but somewhere here. And uh, uh, the neutron star uh, is rather light, it is for the 1.25 
five, maybe one point three, so it makes something like that. And this is indeed observed by in binary uh, Newton stars, uh, where we have this uh, measure, very precise measurement of Newton stars. And it, and when uh, in the standard Coca lab supernova, when uh, the neutrino driven or some something else uh, supernova explosion occurs, uh, the mass of the neutron star is not fixed by to this value, but it is also not fixed to 1.4, so the mass is as the third, say, 20 years ago. Now, uh, it's, uh, in this, uh, it, it, can, it, can, it can be approximated by different forces depending on the, on the mass of the, of the exploding star. For example, uh, if you rely on some um, simulations of supernova explosions, and it, it can, uh, and can, it can be located in a wide range, basically, from 1.4 say to 1.8 solar masses or something like that, very easy. But our M is M sun. Everything is M, M sun. Yes, yes, you are right, M sun. So, um, and... Uh, it's M no, no, no. This is the original mass of the star which yeah, is not, but in, in, in solar masses. So if you multiply by 30, you get four solar masses. M divided to M star. Yeah, M divided to M star. Yes. 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 yes, in solar masses. Yeah. So, and uh, there are a lot of, uh, and we know very well, there are uh, a lot of evidence for massive neutron star indeed. And uh, this is a re one of the recent examples of this particular pulse, uh, millisecond pulse, which have uh, already of, uh, two solar masses. It is impossible to reproduce this mass uh, by evolutionary calculations without assuming that the uh, neutron star was initially as massive as 1.6 solar masses or something like that. So uh, this idea, uh, this is already this is observation support. Yes. So, and, uh, but basically, uh, these schemes are now checked with very careful simulations of stellar evolution. What we did, we compared the crucial parts of this scenario, scenario where we can, especially accretion phases, uh, with uh, uh, MESA code. MESA code is one of the best evolution with stellar code, uh, which, is, which has been developed up to now. So, and uh, this is the results of the comparison. Uh, there are several curves, but uh, 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 calculated by, made by MESA for different parameters, and, uh, and the, uh, our curves, uh, which we use in our calculations, is this not MESA code, this blue one, and this loop also. What's shown here is this uh, M dot uh, accretion rate as a function of orbital period in uh, LMXB, in, uh, very, uh, in very tight low mass X-ray binary, and you see that uh, our code uh, very good reproduced by very precise calculation by, uh, by MESA, by MESA, it was very encouraged for us. And also we um, checked uh, this uh, bright uh, X-ray binaries, uh, this uh, giant, how the uh, how the, how the um, mass accretion uh, occurs in these systems, and again, the green line, uh, the, our, our, our code we use in our, uh, in our calculations, in our code, and the red line, this is what is actually calculated by MESA code. You see the difference at the very beginning of mass, uh, of, of the mass exchange uh, stage, but uh, generally agreement is quite good. Um, so, and uh, applying this, we reproduced very good, applying this code, we reproduced this positions of this uh, persistent LMXBs with uh, fixing some uh, important parameters of, of, this, of the evolution. And the most important is that it is, is possible, it, 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 it became possible only if you assume the uh, initial mass, masses of neutron star uh, lying within the range 1.4, 1.8 solar masses. Otherwise, you cannot uh, reproduce the observed uh, galactic um, sources. So, and uh, Marat Kirchhan, who is here, and uh, he gives us this plot that uh, it is well known, and he will talk about this on Friday, that X-ray luminosity can be, uh, you can measure the galaxy, it's, it's fantastic, by, uh, by X-ray observation you can measure the stellar mass of the galaxy, there is very good correlations, and uh, if, uh, as I already told, if you uh, take these observations, normalized to the mass of the galaxy already, uh, and uh, 
what we did. We tried to reproduce this, and uh, I miss it. I, we obtained the following uh, basic, uh, the main results. As a function of giga years, uh, I'm sorry, for the elliptical galaxy, uh, where all stars are, are assumed to born in the first period um, uh, years. Uh, in red, shown here, this uh, the accretion Newton stars with giants, and in, in black, shown here is the uh, standard elements with uh, main sequence stars. And you see here that uh, uh, the total duration of elements with decays with time, and only bright sources are taken here. And uh, this is the total luminosity, uh, per second per, and, uh, and uh, but um, stars with giants. Uh, systems with red giants, uh, they increase uh, after some time. And in total, the number of sources uh, and the red luminosity stays approximately, approximately uh, constant. Uh, this is how, the, uh, on, in terms of distribution of x luminosity function, shown here is how, the, uh, how appears this population of uh, um, stars with uh, systems with uh, uh, with the Newton stars accreting from uh, red giants in white binary systems uh, appears this time. And uh, so this is a, the same plot uh, um, uh, in terms of number of sources per ten, uh, bright sources, more than 10, 37 per second uh, per unit, uh, per 10 to 10 solar masses in elliptical reality, the second function of H again in GB years. And you see that the agreement is very well. So, uh, in the creating elements, uh, I have no time to, 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 to talk much about that, but I would say that, uh, uh, in fact, there are some sources of creating uh, bright sources uh, with, uh, um, with uh, uh, creating from within, but their fraction is so, so small, so they can sporadically appear. So they, do not contribute significantly to, to the persistent population. And my conclusion is uh, that this evolutionary scheme uh, producing uh, elements of this, how to say this, they was tested with time and uh, all tested with now with already much, much more precise calculations of detailed stage of mass exchange at uh, different uh, crucial crucial uh, things uh, still, there are some uncertainties and, and uh, uh, these uncertainties uh, are of, of course uh, I, I, uh, cannot be uh, so far recovered by um, uh, numerical sim simulations but uh, uh, the, the important message of our populations is that uh, if we allow uh, neutral star masses to vary within a wide range, we can successfully reproduce the evolution of uh, a population after star formation burst, and let's say evolution of some model elliptical belt as a function of time, and it stays approximately constant um, over billions of years. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Costa. Some works it is claimed that uh, LOSB is accreting from uh, white dwarfs should be numerous. And yes. we do not see them apart from global clusters. Yeah, global clusters. So do you have them in your code? Yes, uh, we have. Uh, uh, let me show you here where they come from. This bright guys comes from from this stage, uh, suppose you have not 1.6 solar masses here and instead say 3 or 4 solar masses. And everything goes more or less according to this scenario until this particular phase because uh, here instead of producing elements B, uh, if uh, the system is pretty wide, then uh, uh, this uh, red giant, uh, this stars evolve. I mean, three solar masses stars becomes a red giant, and the second uh, common enveloped stage occurs. And during the second common enveloped stage, already formed neutron stars can can uh, can uh, can uh, can, uh, can go close to the to the core, which which will be a white dwarf. And then we have a situation where the neutron star plus 0.5 white dwarf isn't there. 
We don't, we don't see the systems in the galaxy, right? We, we don't know this, this, these guys. What is the reason for that? And uh, our suspicion is that there, are two, there, there can be two answers for that. Uh, uh, we can uh, increase the efficiency of uh, common world stage to force them to, to, to just to merge, to produce uh, what people would call uh, a torn jig of object or something like that, which apparently probably unstable and collapses to the black hole. This is, this is my feeling. But and, uh, otherwise, uh, otherwise you would have a, a, a very heavy white dwarf because in this uh, in this uh, systems with white dwarf uh, they are very very light and the system is ultra compact and here the white dwarf is very heavy and the mass accretion rate is assumed to be according to modern feeling it could be say ten to the ten to minus seven even. <coughs> So here, this is an extremely bright source which we do not see. So I think that they they should merge, and we do not uh, we do not see them. What questions? There is additional scenario of uh, mass X-ray binary formation uh, proposed by Eagleton. It is triple triple system. Yes, uh, triple system. And they... uh, Kozai and Yes, yes, of course. Uh, you, you you're right. There, there, there can be. Additional channels of forming NMXB, of course, exist. Yeah. For instance, there are globular clusters where the dynamic evolution uh, just make you yeah. ultra quantum binaries, for instance, right? And NMXB also. And uh, uh, this triple system, as you mentioned, also can contribute. But uh, the majority of it seems to be that the majority of stars uh, comes from uh, the massive star formation. Uh, during the formation of the elliptical galaxy, say from merging of uh, spiral galaxies according to modern scenarios, something like that. So they could change a little bit, but they could contribute even more to that. So uh, this even produce more X-ray binaries. And, and there are no this decline which uh, some population systems this cause produce. And our code doesn't produce this strong decline. Because I have a question about uh, if you have this massive neutron stars and they yes. are free from uh, whatever you have here, yes. uh, rather massive companions. Uh, I, I guess they, some of them can reach uh, two and a half solar masses if this is the maximum limit possible limit for the neutron star and uh, collapse to the black holes. Do you have such a yes, possibility yes, in your? Yes, it's a good, it's a, it's a good point, but I, I should say that uh, <coughs> the ma maximum mass which we, which we found in this calculation was about 2.1 solar mass or something like that. Not, so it doesn't exceed the Pirkenian bulk of limit if you assume it to be 2.5 or something like that. But in principle it's interesting. Who knows, maybe we can, uh, in principle we can try to, to, to widen the range of the neutral star masses from the very beginning. Because during evolution, uh, unless you Unless you admit uh, something like hypercritical accretion during the common envelope stage, okay. this, this kind of things, which is not still, I would say, it's not. So, still. but you, you are limited by Eddington? Uh, uh, yes, okay. yes. If you live in, by Eddington, you never produce. Okay. So, uh, in principle, it's possible, but it's not in this code yet. Yeah, yeah, yeah it can be implemented easily, but you do that. Okay, any other questions? Yeah, Ed. Yeah. What fraction do the globular clusters? Yes, in a recent paper uh, by the authors, Leonard and company, they 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 try to reconcile this uh, this how to say their standard code, their standard evolution of uh, of the minus with the observed line, and they uh, their their feeling was that if they from observations add uh, local clusters. Then they more or less will be okay, uh, but uh, uh, and the fraction of global cluster is uh, is uh, it's more than dependent thing of course. But you know, of course you can add a few sources at least for global clusters which exist in the galaxy. But uh, I, I repeat that my my basic conclusion was that uh, even without taking into global clusters, you already right accept some. Uh, very wide binaries, but bright enough because this is a very low mass uh, giants in uh, state of the continent and stars, which is... Uh, okay, let's thank Constantine again.
next speaker is Sergei Sazon, who will talk about true fractional obscured AGNs. <coughs> Good evening. I'm not sure if this is the first AGN talk today. Probably it is. Okay. So, uh, in my talk, I want to discuss uh, one uh, interesting observational fact about AGNs, which I think has become more and more evident uh, over the last 10 years or so from X-ray and part X-ray surveys. Uh, and I think actually uh, Mike and I were among the first who noticed it back in 2004 with our RxTS new survey. And this fact is that the relative fraction of obscured X-ray absorbed AGNs decreases with luminosity. It's not constant. So why is it? And first of all, why is it interesting? I, I think my motivation is twofold. First, we'd like to know what uh, this so-called obscuring doors is. Uh, I think it's fair to say that nobody knows so far. Maybe it's clumpy, maybe it's not, maybe it's something else. So it's the central element of the AGN unification schemes. And the uh, second motivation is that the shape of the cosmic X-ray, the ground spectral shape, tells you that there is probably a significant uh, population of strongly obscured AGNs in the universe, at least according to claims of some people, some purpose. So you need, perhaps, uh, this component here due to content thick AGN to explain the shape of the cosmic spectrogram. So, uh, and if there is such population, then it has consequences, of course, for the history of the massive black hole growth in the universe. So, uh, so the results I want to discuss here are based on our own integral sky five X-ray survey. Many people heard many talks on this before, and uh, uh, we have several catalogs. I, I think two official catalogs issued by Roman Krivanos and Leaks, and one was based on 3.5 years uh, uh, of data here, and uh, the second version was based on seven years of data. And uh, in this catalog, we have 150 known blazer AGN uh, outside the galactic plane. I'm excluding the galactic plane just uh, for safety reasons, so to say, uh, uh, just to avoid problems with unidentified sources, which are still there, few of them. And I think the next talk will be on blazer AGN. Right. So we have here 150 non blazer AGN, which are mostly C3 galaxies. Some of them you would better call places. And uh, here's the distribution on the <coughs> redshift luminosity plane. Yeah, the red points are from this catalog. And uh, two points are important here. One is that uh, most of our sources are local at Z less than 0.1. So there is no cosmology here. We're studying local population. And uh, the second point is that we cover effectively three or four orders of magnitude uh, uh, decades of luminosity. So it's a really representative sample of our uh, local universe. So what we can do with this sample, uh, of course, the first thing we can do with a function looks like this. So as I said before, we're covering, we're covering this range of luminosities. And this is similar to what other people see in other kinds of uh, surveys, not, not only X-ray uh, surveys for AGNs. And important here is that above some luminosity, a few times 10 to the 43, per second, uh, the luminosity function, uh, the slope of the luminosity function becomes very steep, uh, higher than 2. And here I'm plotting dn over d log l. Okay? So in these units, uh, the slope of the power law is more than 2. That's important. Uh, and I should have said before that we are selecting our sources in the part of the band of 17 to 60 kV. So this is our working band. So what we can do next, we can, uh, for most of our sources, there is a good extra spectrum information. So, uh, well, first of all, for all of them, essentially, we, we know the distance direction. And also, uh, for almost all of these sources, we have reliable estimates of their absorption column density. So you know that in AGNs, uh, in type 2 AGNs, you have at low energy support absorption cutoff, and so you, uh, the most important parameter is NH, the absorption column. And we know it very well for our sources. Uh, 
least for uh, the vast majority of them. And here's the distribution of these absor uh, uh, absorption columns. So about half of our sources are unabsorbed, that is the NH is less than 10 to the 22, and uh, most of these sources are classified optically as type 1s, so they have broad emission lines. There is a very good correlation between uh, X-ray classification and optical. And the other half is uh, X-ray absorbed sources, and here's the distribution of these columns. You can see that it's broad, and most of them are what I can call weakly absorbed, so the optical depth of the respect to Thomson scattering is less than 1, and H less than 10 to the 24 <coughs> hydrogen atoms per centimeter squared. And there is a small fraction of strongly absorbed sources, which you may call content peak or nearly content peak sources. So here they are. And uh, the most interesting thing happens when we look at the same distribution as a function of luminosity. So, here I have divided my uh, whole sample into three groups according to their luminosity. So luminosity less than 10 to the 43, uh, larger than 10 to the 44, and in between. And uh, you can see a big difference between these. So the low luminosity ones, most of them are absorbed for type 2 objects. So you can see there are maybe 10 type 1 objects here and several tens uh, absorbed ones. But if you look at the most powerful luminous sources, then most of them are type 1s. So they show no <coughs> spectacular X-ray absorption in their spectrum. Uh, even better, you can see this effect uh, if you look at this plot. So what I'm putting here is uh, the relative fraction of X-ray absorbed sources as a function of luminosity. And you can see that it goes down from about 100% essentially with a big uncertainty of course to maybe 20% down to almost zero. And I can assure you that this trend is significant, so it's not consistent with a constant uh, fraction at 5 or 6 sigma. I don't know. So, people have now seen the same effect in many surveys. and. Uh, of course, uh, people have tried to interpret this in terms of this obscuring torus model. So perhaps you have this uh, obscuring dusty torus and its relative thickness decreases when you increase the luminosity for some reason, for some physical reasons. I don't have time here to uh, go into the detail. So uh, in terms of this model, we can fit this dependence as the effective solid angle of the torus, which is this one, uh, uh, to be linear with the luminosity. So, that has been, uh, I'd say, the very popular interpretation recently. The same kind of, the same observational effect, uh, as I already said several times, has been seen in other surveys, for example, in uh, the sweet bad survey, which is very similar to our integral survey. So it's uh, more or less the same energy band, uh, also in all sky coverage. I should have said that our survey is not a uh, uh, true survey, it's a serendipitous survey, but it's more or less the same for sweet band. So you see again the same result. As the luminosity goes up, the relative Russian of absorptive gen goes down. Moreover, it has been seen in uh, surveys performed in the standard uh, X ray band, the low 10 kV. Here's a nice compilation by Inke Hasinger from surveys by, I think, Chandra, maybe Aska, I don't demand something else. And here you can see the same phenomenon, but already in, uh, not only in the local universe, but also in uh, various retro beams. So the same trend. So why is that? On the other hand, uh, people have noticed that the same phenomenon is perhaps not seen uh, in other kinds of surveys, not in extra ones. And this was pointed out in particular in this paper by Lawrence and Ellis, 2010, where they again discussed that uh, there is this tendency uh, for X-ray surveys. But on the other hand, when you uh, select your HGNs in, uh, in infrared or radio bands, 
and then classify uh, sources according to uh, this uh, standard optical classification. So you divide them into type 1s and type 2s, then you don't see this uh, declining trend anymore. So uh, the fraction seems to be around 60, maybe 65 percent, <coughs> regardless of luminosity. So there seems to be some discrepancy. And uh, I have been thinking over this last 10 years several, uh, many times about why is this, and recently we started to think about this again with Eugene, and uh, we thought, uh, what if this uh, phenomenon which is observed in X-rays is just a selection effect? Of course, in hard X-rays you uh, uh, select, uh, you are much less biased with respect to absorption than in the standard x band. But there might still be a significant bias because when your obscuring torus, uh, torus becomes optically thick with respect to bottom uh, scattering, then even hard X rays can be intercepted by the torus, then uh, they lose energy due to quantum recoil, and especially uh, uh, in the end, some of these X rays may be photoresorbed. So we decided to study this in detail. And for this, uh, we took our integral sample, and as I already told you, uh, we have uh, 150 AGNs uh, in total, non laser ones, of uh, which 13 uh, objects can be classified as quantum uh, thick or nearly quantum thick. And uh, the spectrum of these sources usually look like this. So if you look from 1 keV up to 100 keV, you see a significant drop. So in the hard X-rays, you have a significant flux, that's why we detect it with integral, but then the flux drops by one or two orders of magnitude. And if you have data like this, then you can uh, fit some model to this and infer the absorption column density. And usually it's difficult actually to tell if the, this column is, say, 10 to the 25 or 10 to the uh, 24, because it's not that easy to distinguish uh, a reflection dominated case from a uh, tra transmission dominated case. So there is some uh, play here. Yeah. And uh, anyway, so for most of these uh, 13 sources, we have uh, not me in the literature, there are good spectral data, so there are more or less reliable <coughs> estimates of uh, the absorption poles, and in particular, Suzaku's help. So then we consider this simple model, uh, literally a torus, a uh, donut of uh, cold gas, constant density here, and there are two parameters. One is the open angle of the torus theta, and uh, the second parameter is the absorption column uh, along the diameter in H. And we ask the question, what would the distant observer see from a given direction, given by this angle alpha? And it's easy to understand that if you look from, say, this direction, you will see uh, only the transmitted flux. So the, source, uh, the flux <coughs> emission emitted by the central source, which is assumed to be isotropic, and it will be attenuated by some degree within this uh, gas or dust. If you look from here, then you will see again the transmitted flux, but in addition you will see some reflected emission from this uh, distant part of the torus. And if you look from here, within the funnel of the torus. You will see the central source directly, but in addition, you again will see some reflected emission. That, that's the uh, idea. So, uh, with Monte Carlo simulations, we calculated this spectrum, and uh, here is the intrinsic spectrum, so what we assume for the source. It's a parallel with the high energy cutoff, and we need this high energy cutoff to explain <coughs> the shape of the cosmic X-ray graph, so we know it is there, but it's not very important for us here. And if you look at small angles alpha zero or uh, within this funnel, then it, we, we see this reflection component here. And for uh, type two uh, directions, we get spectra like this. So you see much less emission here. And now uh, we recall that our integral band is down here between 17 and 60 kV. So it's right where we have this reflection pump and we have uh, significant emission in type 2 objects. So now we can see how this uh, X-ray flux, which would be measured by integral, uh, depends on the 
optical depth of the torus in each equatorial here and the viewing angle. And here I've assumed that the open angle of the torus coupled with is 45 degrees. And you can see that for type 1s, uh, of course for NH uh, about 0, you have this, uh, uh, the flux is equal to the intrinsic one, but then it goes up by maybe 70% uh, here when the optical depth becomes 2 or 3, and then you have this plateau. Why? Because uh, the reflection, uh, the reflected emission is not sensitive anymore to the optical depth of the torus. Uh, the torus acts as an imperfect uh, mirror in this case. And you have these dependencies for uh, directions uh, going through the torus. And of course, the more uh, the angle alpha becomes, the less flux you will see. And uh, now you can uh, plot uh, the inferred uh, luminosity, what you would find by multiplying the measured flux by 4 pi distance squared, they'll observe uh, the ratio of it to the intrinsic luminosity. And how it depends on the uh, absorption column and on the open angle of the torus. And uh, here we've averaged uh, the viewing directions uh, for all type 1 directions and for all type 2 directions. Because usually when you have a particular object in your sample, you don't know exactly uh, this angle alpha. You just know that it's type 1 and type 2. So it makes sense to average all these angles. And again, you see that for type 1s, for moderate uh, absorption columns, above a few times 10 to the 24, you, you have an increase of 50 or 70 percent, and you have this factor of radiance too. So what does it mean for us? Uh, you can imagine yourself that for a given intrinsic luminosity, depending on the direction from which you look, you'll have a greater chance to find uh, an object if it's type 1, because it, its inferred luminosity is higher than its intrinsic luminosity. So you can detect it uh, out to a larger distance because your survey is flux limited. And uh, on the contrary, if uh, your object is type 2, you will detect it from a small one. So what we did is we uh, instructed uh, what I can call an intrinsic luminosity function of our AGNs. And we did it separately for three types of sources, unabsorbed AGN, weakly absorbed and strongly absorbed. And we did this uh, in the following way. For each object, for each of these uh, 150 uh, AGNs, we corrected the observed luminosity to the intrinsic luminosity according to our calculations. And then we used uh, the usual 1 over Vmax method uh, to estimate the space density. So each object gives its own estimate of the space density of AGNs with this given intrinsic luminosity. So here's the final result. Uh, three sets of uh, points here are the inferred luminosity functions for unabsorbed AGNs, for weakly absorbed AGNs, and for strongly absorbed AGNs. So uh, what happened in comparison with the luminosity function I showed you before, the AGN ones in blue here have shifted to the left. So if I plotted here the luminosity function I showed you before, then these type 1s have shifted a little bit to the left because their correction factor is less than 1. The intrinsic luminosity is smaller than the observed luminosity. And in the case of this intermediate category, uh, not much has happened. And for strongly absorbed sources, they move to the right. So now we can infer the intrinsic obscured fraction. So we just need to divide the luminosity function of type 2s by the luminosity function of type 1s. And here's the result. So in comparison, I can show you what I showed you before. So you can see that although this trend is still there, but it's not significant anymore. Uh, this was without this correction, and this is with the correction. First of all, you see that all the points have gone up a little bit. And second, that they are pretty much consistent with the <coughs> constant fraction here. And this constant fraction, in fact, corresponds to what you would expect if all AGNs have the same open angle of 45 degrees. You see. Um, unfortunately, we have uh, big uh, uncertainties here. This is the price you have to pay because you have 
a small number of uh, strong web superior objects. So my conclusions, uh, although the measured fraction of the chain decreases with luminosity, which indicates that open angle electrodes increases with luminosity, when you correct for the selection bias of detecting uh, EGNs in hard X-rays, uh, this trend becomes insignificant. And uh, we'd like to continue this effort, and uh, of course it's desirable to use a larger EGN sample. We have Swift is better here than integral, it has a few times more sources now. And to be more self-consistent, we need to probably redo the spectral analysis to infer NH values ourselves in, in the same model. Then we'd like to see what this means in terms of uh, more complicated uh, torus models, and perhaps go to high Z using uh, X-ray surveys from Chandra and something else. Okay, thank you for being <laughs>
and he will talk about uh, blazers and uh, permeate variations of blazers and what is the title? And I guess Forrest will be among those that will change the title of his talk. Yeah. <laughs> in the last second, so. Okay, okay uh, very, very simple title, actually. Uh, and very simple process which we are talking about. This is, if you have two bottoms, one, one of G range, uh, another tens of E V range, they can interrupt producing electron positron pair and therefore G photon disappears. And trivial estimates show that uh, the opacity of this UV photons is quite uh, sufficient to exit unity in real objects. Well, therefore, you can uh, see this absorption in uh, bright blazers. Uh, I will briefly talk the history about this. The history is not that simple and uh, quite instructive, actually. And uh, then about our new work, which is not published yet, but already submitted. When, well, the first, our first paper, we, when we were very enthusiastic, you see, uh, spectra, which we approximate by a power law and a clear break. This break, this hydrogen, corresponds to uh, hydrogen absorption, lim hydrogen limon alpha uh, edge, which is a certain electron box, and there are another break in G range, which is helium 2 uh, limon alpha edge absorption, which is 50 electron volts. Well, and everything looks nice. Well, but then uh, there is the issue. Whether a power law is a, a good new hypothesis? The answer is no. Because if we look on the whole blazer spectrum, typical blazer, we see that we deal with a wide uh, emission hump, which is an order of magnitude. Magnitudes. Why? But nevertheless, it's not a power law. And uh, after we give up about this power law of null hypothesis, everything is getting much worse. Because you just, you just lose the significance, statistical significance. Here, this is a quite significant break. But if you approximate this by a smooth code, no hypothesis, then you will lose uh, uh, terribly in, in statistical significance. These are spectra which we used for our hypothesis. I will skip this. And this is uh, what we get after uh, with this more conservative no hypothesis, which is uh, log normal distribution or uh, log parabola. Doesn't matter. It's, uh, different names uh, for the same. Well, after this, we find that no one uh, of blazers are highly significant. Only margin marginally significant, like 2 sigma, 3 sigma, and only one, the brightest, 3C454.303, was still signific highly significant. You see, the uh, chi-square drops from 130, for um, <coughs> low parabola, no hypothesis to right to three. So it was uh, again we were very enthusiastic. It, it was success. But another other uh, blazers still are not significant. Uh, let's try uh, uh, second analysis. Just blue shift each of bright blazers uh, to reduces to one uh, reference system and then uh, just some way up. <coughs> and this is the result. You see again, a clear gray corresponding to helium to absorption. In the right place, if we will shift uh, all this picture, it will, uh, <coughs> the guys prayer will rise. Uh, and uh, the correspondent paper was already written, and fortunately we didn't publish it. Hmm. Uh, fortunately we uh, uh, decided to check um, whether it is still valid for a new, um, new 
new pass of Fermi data reduction. This was done for pass 6. It was in, uh, it was uh, one and a half year ago, and then already was issued pass 7, and we checked whether it works. Well. And it doesn't survive. And uh, the reason was very clear. This is the uh, effective area of uh, Fermi for pass 6 and pass 7. This is actually a sample effect. You see, the, this is pass 6 blue dots. And you see the break here. This is the break of uh, an opposite side, but when you will divide uh, your counts, perfect effect, you will break. You will have a break on the opposite side. And uh, uh, the origin of this break is absolutely unclear. Because there is no physical reason to have a break in this place in, in an effective area. And uh, this is uh, again pass pa 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 6 for front detector and uh, back detector. And all this break is due to front detector. This is something mysterious. Well, and in pass 7 there is nothing like this. And the spectra looks different. You see, all uh, this effect are subtle. But we are looking for a subtle effect, which is an absorption feature. And uh, this is uh, the spectrum of the same object for the same time interval, but for pass, pass 6, which is black and is steep and the break is sharper, and uh, red, which is pass 7. And uh, this is uh, quite crucial, crucial because, um, again, we have lost its significance. Uh, the break uh, still survived in this object, but only at 3 sigma level. And then what, what's a catastrophe? Because, uh, because uh, well, this is taken analysis again for brightest bla bla blazers. There are no, no sign of having to absorption break. But there is a good absorption in hydrogen, lime and argon. In principle, this is a more natural situation because you have much more potency in hydrogen, lime and argon than in helium-2. Helium-2 requires a very high ionization parameter. This is more natural, but nevertheless, we, have, we still have two objects with three sigma uh, helium-2. Uh, and these objects are both exceptionally, exceptionally bright in uh, uh, UV. They are accretion, exceptionally bright accretion disks. It's like 10 to 47, both of them. And also we see in the individual object, objects, uh, clear, laminar, usual uh, hydrogen laminar break. Well, this is the table. Uh, these are all blazers with no redshift, without strong source confusion, uh, which are brighter than some threshold above 5 GV. Okay, most of them have significant hydrogen opacity. And uh, you see 5 and 5 sigma and the second 6 sigma. This is taken, this is 6, six sigma without this object, this just uh, treated separately. All of this is six sigma. So the things changed. Yeah, and uh, another test because yeah now we have to be as careful as possible. Still check uh, how look <coughs> spectra which we cannot uh, expect uh, any breaks in past seven uh, data. Okay, these are uh, dim fraction, uh, fractions of the sky. It's about uh, one quarter of the total sky, which is uh, avoiding, uh, avoiding galactic disk, avoiding any objects. Uh, here we have, we have to have a power loss spectrum, except maybe there is some uh, uh, other galaxies we 
ir vežgi tam malonerti. And it actually uh, is really very close to Pavlov. Uh, in past six, it was a dip here, a small dip, and then rise due to uh, lose selection from chest particles. It was really, if you plot the same for a six, you have a dip here, and then clear the ground of chest particles. Uh, and these are the four strongest pillars. So no, no signs of any breaks. So now we think that we are right. And uh, how the things uh, changed. So really the situation uh, now is not so impressive, but more realistic actually. Because uh, in realistic case you have to expect that you will see a brighter feature in Lyman Arc absorption and weaker in Hiram 2. That's natural. Then another thing that there is no one object with a very high opacity. Uh, in principle, in principle, if you just calculate luminosity, approximate size of the image uh, of the proton region, you can get pretty high opacity. But there is no one case with a high opacity. It's in the range uh, three, four in Thompson units, which means that uh, the peak, the, the peak cross section for photon photon uh, absorption is five time, times less, and therefore we have we have a pass to less than unity in in all cases. Well, and the position of the break is consistent with the isotropic distribution of UV photons. If, for example, if it were backstream back photons, then we will see a break at higher energies, just because of kinematics of uh, this process. And it seems that some photons go head on. So it, it, the isotropic distribution describes the position of the break pretty well. Then what we can get from this? Uh, I think that the most important thing is that we can uh, rule out uh, disk, disk induction launch of the disk. Oh, of the, of the jet, sorry. Because uh, just you, you can simply estimate uh, the size of the broadline region in terms of gravitational radii. If, if you take, for example, 10,000 kilometers per second, which is a little bit too high, uh, you will have 10 to 3 gravitational radius. Uh, maybe typical, uh, typical velocity is a little bit less, but anyway, we are somewhere around a few thousand gravitational radii. Then, uh, how do the um, Actually, the Lorentz factor of the jet rises pretty slow um, because the Lorentz factor is the radius of the jet to the radius of light cylinder. So you align the, the magnetic field, and uh, well, if the jet is parabolic, you have a square root here. And you can see that uh, if the jet is launched by black hole itself, by a black hole inserted in the sun magnetic field, you have a light cylinder like three uh, gravitational radii. And therefore, you have one factor 20 at already at uh, 10 to 3 gravitational radii. The disk launch differs by a factor of 30 approximately. And you just cannot accelerate this to sufficient Lorentz factor closer <coughs> than, than 10,000 of, or 10,000 of gravitational radius. Uh, so, actually this deserves a separate paper, but at least for some objects we can rule out this uh, induction for the jet launch. Well, 
well, uh, about, uh, about low opacity, probably uh, the most natural uh, explanation is that the uh, emission region of the jet is very extended to the elbow of the jet. So some of photons are extended already beyond uh, the broad emission line region. That's all. Questions? What is maybe I missed the point? You are considered only the emission lines, right? But why don't you consider continuum or the value of continuum in the class? We consider, I, I will show what we consider. Oh, we consider this as, a, as one model which is calculated by Yuri for um, a model of uh, broad emission lines. Yeah. And we consider also a simple one. Uh, Two, two complex, uh, absorption complex, uh, two lines actually, two, uh, double absorber, which is oversimplified of course, but in, in some senses useful also. And for this we used different ionization parameter, which is, uh, this is logarithm of uh, ionization degree, we use uh, different models and find that uh, it is really different for, some, for different objects. I mean, I should comment that actually the strongest features are not even Lyman alpha, but Lyman yeah, continuum yeah. of hydrogen and the recombination continuum of, of hydrogen and helium two if they're strongly ionized. Yeah, but it's n not far from from Lyman. Yeah, they're very, it's very, very close. They, they basically come together. So it's yeah. No, yeah. Fine. Uh, you were uh, saying that uh, there might be uh, problems with the charged particles uh, in in carbon. Have you tried to look at uh, spectra at different uh, geomagnetic rigidity places? Uh, no, because, because it was just a separate test and we just cut, we just cut the zenith angle at uh, 105 degrees. Yeah, but then you can uh, take data taken at uh, one rigidity and another rigidity to see if there is a difference. Yeah, I agree, but we didn't. Okay. What about this hydrogen absorption and helium to absorption? Is it uh, absolutely necessary for your model or not? No. Because not, uh, in real yeah. objects, broad line region may be completely different. The, 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 they are very big <coughs> and uh, we don't see copyright, copyright anything, you see. Uh, these are strong, <coughs> strongest BLX. It just stacked stack up strongest bail box. We don't see anything here. Uh, just because they can work with maybe another reason for this question. Yeah, but, but uh, you see, we, we shouldn't expect because they have very weak uh, broadline vision, if any. And here we do have uh, broadline vision, we see, and we know luminous, which is uh, actually huge. In the, in the brightest quasar 3C454, only in one line, line monarch, you have 10 to 45 arcs. Actually, it is, it is too large, and we have to explain why, uh, why we have uh, only partial absorption, but not the total absorption, like exponential cutoff. More questions? If not, let's thank Boris and other speakers of this session. <laughs> So we are right in time and we start with uh, 6.30 there is a concert in the main conference room and after that there is a banquet.